Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is a, a very exciting evening for us and a really exciting collaboration. We're, we're so honored to be working with Lincoln Center um, and the amazing team uh, of Jordana, Viviana, Mira, the core team, and all the amazing technical support and staff at Lincoln Center who have made tonight's event possible, uh, but also this great collaboration uh, with the High School for Arts, Imagination, and Inquiry. And um, we're so thrilled to have so many people here from the school, uh, to have Fatu as part of our, of our cast, and to know that this is all working towards this performance on uh, May 19th. The, um, the students at the High School for Arts, Imagination, and Inquiry are very lucky. They've got great teachers. We've been working with Benjamin. We've been working with Jeffrey. Um, and the whole staff uh, and faculty over at the school are really remarkable. And um, they're spending a whole year working with the material of Voices of a People's History of the United States and with Howard's book, A People's History of the United States. And this really was our vision when Howard and I started out on this journey now maybe around 13, 14 years ago. Uh, and certainly a journey that Howard had started so many years earlier, 35 years ago to the publication of A People's History of the United States. But even uh, longer, when you consider all the years of work and organizing and activism uh, that led up to him writing that book uh, in 1980. And it really was um, that idea, Howard was so committed to the idea of making these resources of hope that you'll hear on stage tonight so beautifully performed available to a new generation of people. Um, and that's why he wanted to dedicate our book, Voices of a People's History of the United States, to the rebel voices of the coming generation. So that's really the spirit in which we do this performance tonight. Uh, I also want to just make a couple quick announcements and a few more thank yous. Um, there are books uh, over here from Haymarket Books, uh, independent nonprofit book publisher uh, that I've had the privilege to work with over the last uh, 15 years now. And um, so you can get books, uh, including Voices of a People's History of the United States, 10th Anniversary Edition. You can also get a book published by Viggo Mortensen, who uh, I hope everyone had a chance to hear him this morning on Democracy Now!, but if you didn't, please do uh, go listen to Democracy Now! and their wonderful interview with him this morning, where he talked about his publishing house, Percival Press, uh, and the very important work he's doing. He's uh, just relaunched, uh, well, he's launched a new edition of a book first published 12 years ago called Twilight of Empire. I had the great privilege of writing an introduction to the new edition of that book, which has just come out, an updated ed edition along with another introduction by Dennis Kucinich. Uh, we're launching that book tomorrow night at McNally Jackson, for those of you who can come down at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Um, there's flyers for that event at the Haymarket table, also here at this information desk. Um, Vigo is also going to be signing copies of that book after, um, after the event, and I'm happy to sign copies of Voices. Uh, I also want to let people know that one of the people you'll hear from tonight, Vigo will be reading uh, Joe Hill, who 100 years ago, November 19th, uh, the great labor troubadour, songwriter, poet of the, of the labor movement of this country, um, and really someone whose songs have been embraced around the world, was killed by the state of Utah, by, assassinated by a firing squad. And on November 20th at the New School, we're going to do an event to honor Joe Hill and performances by a number of people, including some of the people who are on stage tonight, Allison, Brian, Susan. So I hope you'll check out that event as well. Um, and then just finally, I want to thank, uh, in addition to Samantha, who's helping with the book sales, uh, Matt Covey uh, and Brian, uh, sorry, Matt Covey, I already mentioned Brian Jones, uh, Brenda Coughlin and Dan Coughlin, who've been part of the Voices of a People's History of the organization, and Anna Strout. Uh, all these people have been vital to us being able to do this work over the last 10 years and be able to do this performance tonight. So with that, I really hope you have a wonderful show, and I want to welcome to the stage the, the remarkable uh, partners in crime who we have here with us tonight, starting with Susan Porfar on the stage, Brian Jones, Allison Moore, Hayes Carl, 
Fatu Cham, <laughs> Vigo Mortensen, <laughs> Kathleen Chalfant, Stu, <laughs> Peter Sarsgaard, and Teddy Thompson. Thank you. All right, we're all here, right? Stu, we're here? All right. Peace. Okay, so we'll begin tonight with Sam Cooke. His remarkable song, penned in 1964, A Change Is Gonna Come. In recent years, the idealized and romanticized picture of Christopher Columbus has been reconsidered. 
The evidence for this revised view comes in part from Bartolome de las Casas, who witnessed the consequences of Columbus's conquest, which he describes in the following passages, first published in 1542. The Indies were discovered in the year 1492. 49 years have passed since the first settlers penetrated the land, the first being the large and most happy isle called Hispaniola, perhaps the most densely populated place in the world. There must be close to 200 leagues of land on this island, and all the land so far discovered is a beehive of people. It is as though God had crowded into these lands the great majority of mankind. And of all the infinite universe of humanity, these people are the most guileless, the most devoid of wickedness and duplicity, the most obedient and faithful to their native masters and to the Spanish Christians whom they serve. And because they are so weak and complacent, they are less able to endure heavy labor and soon die of no matter what malady. Yet into this sheepfold, into this land of meek outcasts, there came some Spaniards who immediately behaved like ravening wild beasts, wolves, tigers, or lions that had been starved for many days, killing, terrorizing, afflicting, torturing, and destroying the native peoples, doing all this with the strangest and most varied new methods of cruelty never seen or heard of before, and to such a degree that this island of Hispaniola once so populous, having a population that I estimated to be more than three millions, has now a population of barely 200 persons. Their reason for killing and destroying such an infinite number of souls is that the Christians have an ultimate aim, which is to acquire gold and to swell themselves with riches in a very brief time and thus rise to a high estate disproportionate to their merits. It should be kept in mind that their insatiable greed and ambition, the greatest ever seen in the world, is the cause of their villainies. And also those lands are so rich and felicitous, the native peoples so meek and patient, so easy to subject, that our Spaniards have no more consideration for them than beasts. No, for thanks be to God, they have treated beasts with some respect, I should say instead like excrement on the public squares. The Indians began to seek ways to throw the Christians out of their lands. They took up arms, but their weapons were very weak and of little service in offense and still less in defense. The Christians, with their horses and swords and pikes, began to carry out massacres and strange cruelties against them. They attacked the towns and spared neither the children nor the aged, nor pregnant women, nor women in childbed not only stabbing them and dismembering them, but cutting them to pieces as if dealing with sheep in the slaughterhouse. They made some low, wide gallows on which the hanged victim's feet almost touched the ground, stringing up people in lots of 13 in memory of our Redeemer and his 12 apostles, then set fire to wood at their feet and thus burned them alive. When tied to the stake, the cacique Hatwe a very important noble, was told by a Franciscan friar about the God of the Christians and the, and the articles of faith. And he was told what he could do in the brief time that remained to him in order to be saved and go to heaven. The cacique, who had never heard any of this before and was told he could go to hell if he did not adopt the Christian faith, he would suffer eternal torment asked the Franciscan friar if Christians all went to heaven. When told that they did, he said he would prefer to go to hell. Mm. In 1851, the black abolitionist and former slave Sojourner Truth spoke to a gathering of feminists in Akron, Ohio, her speech, only a few minutes long, was a landmark moment in feminist and abolitionist history. Well, children, where there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think the twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights. The white man will be in a fix pretty soon. 
But what's all this here talking about? The men over there says that women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches, and have the blessed place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages, or over mud puddles, or give me any best place. Ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arms. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as men when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. Ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, nothing but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's this they call it? Intellect, that's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's right or Negro's right? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quarter, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says, women can't have as much right as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? <laughs> Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. <laughs> if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. Now they is asking to do it. The men better let them. July 4th <laughs> is held up as a day to celebrate the struggle for freedom and independence. But the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass, himself a former slave, dared to challenge the exaltation of the holiday. Here for is part of his remarkable address in, 19, sorry, in 1852 to the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could truthfully be returned to these questions. Then would my task be light, my burden easy and delightful. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th July is yours not mine. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today 
pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke, for it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more bloody and shocking than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will. Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse. And when you have found the last, lay your facts by the, by the side of the everyday practices of this nation. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without rival. <laughs> On October 16th, 1859, John Brown and nearly two dozen slaves seized the armory at Harper's Ferry in West Virginia hoping to use its massive arsenal in the struggle to end slavery. Captured and brought to trial in nearby Charlestown, Brown was found guilty of treason, and one month before his execution, he addressed a courtroom in Charleston, West Virginia. I have, if it may please the court, a few words to say. In the first place, I deny everything but what I have all along admitted, the design on my part to free the slaves, I intended certainly to have made a thing of that matter, as I did last winter when I went to Missouri and there took slaves without the snapping of a gun on either side, moved them through the country, and finally left them in Canada. I'd have designed to do the same thing again on a larger scale. That was all I intended. I never did intend murder or treason or the destruction of property or to make insurrection. I have another objection, and that is, it is unjust that I should suffer such a penalty. Had I interfered in the matter which I admit, and which I admit has been fairly proved, had I so interfered on behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or on behalf of any of their friends, either father, mother, brother, sister, wife, or children, or any of that class, and suffered and sacrificed what that I would have done in this infer interference, it would have been all right. Hmm? And every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. This court acknowledges, and I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament. 
And that teaches me that whatsoever I would do, whatsoever would that man do, should, whatsoever I would that man should do unto me, I should do even so to them. It teaches me further, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavor to act upon that instruction. I say, I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I've always freely admitted that I have done in behalf of his despised poor was not wrong, it's right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit. So let it be done. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony was one of 14 women who defied the law to cast a ballot in the presidential election. She was arrested for, quote, knowingly voting without having a lawful right to vote, and later was found guilty. When her lawyer appealed the verdict, she addressed the court in response to a question from the judge. Has the prisoner anything to say why sentence shall not be pronounced? Yes, Your Honor, I have many things to say. <laughs> For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights, my judicial rights are all alike ignored. Robbed of the fundamental privilege of citizenship, I am degraded from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. And not only myself individually, but all of my sex are, by your honor's verdict, doomed to political subjection under this so-called okay. Republican form of government. Yeah, okay. The court cannot listen to a rehearsal of argument, which the prisoner's counsel has already consumed three hours in presenting. May it please your honor. I am not arguing the question, but simply stating the reasons why sentence cannot, in justice, be pronounced against me. Your denial of my citizen's right to vote is the denial of my right of consent as one of the governed, the denial of my right of representation as one of the taxed, the denial of my right to a trial by a jury of my peers as an offender against the law. The court cannot allow the prisoner to go on. But your honor will not deny me this one and only poor privilege of protest against this high-handed outrage upon my citizens' rights. May it please the court to remember that since the day of my arrest last November, this is the first time that either myself or any member of my disenfranchised <clears throat> class has been allowed a word of defense okay. against judge. Yeah. The prisoner must sit down. <laughs> the court cannot allow it. Of all my prosecutors, from the corner grocery politician who entered the complaint to the United States Marshal, Commissioner, District Attorney, District Judge, Your Honor on the Bench. Not one is my peer, but each and all are my political sovereigns. And had Your Honor submitted my case to the jury, as was clearly your duty, even then I should have had just cause of protest, for not one of those men was my peer, but each and every one of them was my political superior. The court must insist the prisoner has been tried according to the established forms of law. Yes, your honor, but by forms of law made by men, interpreted by men, administered by men, in favor of men and against women. But yesterday, the same man-made forms of law declared it a crime, punishable by a $1,000 fine and six months imprisonment to give a cup of cold water, a crust of bread, or a night's shelter to a panting fugitive tracking his way to Canada. And every man or woman in whose veins coursed a drop of human sympathy violated that wicked law. 
reckless of consequences, and was justified in doing so. As then the slaves who got their freedom had to take it over or under or through the unjust forms of law, precisely so now must women take it to get a right to a voice in this government. And I have taken mine, and I intend to take it at every turn. All right, the court orders the prisoner to sit down. It will not allow another word. When I was brought before your honor for trial, I, I hoped for a broad and liberal interpretation of the Constitution and its recent amendments, but failing to get this, I mean, failing even to get a trial by a jury not of my peers, I ask not leniency at your hands, but rather the full rigors of the law. Okay, the court must insist, the sentence of the court is that you pay a fine of $100 and the costs of the prosecution. May it please your honor, I will never pay a dollar of your unjust debt. <laughs> All the stock in trade I possess is a debt of $10,000 incurred by publishing my paper, The Revolution, the sole object of which was to educate all women to do precisely as I have done. And I will work on with might and main to pay every dollar of that honest debt, but not a penny shall go to this unjust claim. And I shall earnestly and persistently continue to urge all women in the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. In the souls of black folk, the black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois stated prophetically that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Here, Stu presents a selection of this classic text. Between me and the other world, there is an ever unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in half-hesitant sorts of ways, I me curiously or compassionately. And then, instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man <laughs> in my town. Or, do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or am interested or reduce the boiling to a simmer as the occasion may require to the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I seldom answer a word, I seldom answer a word, and yet being a problem is a strange experience. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals, and one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in mine own house? The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows and without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. The nation has not yet found peace from its sins. The nation has not yet found peace from its sins. 
The freedom has not yet found its, the freed man has not yet found freedom in his promised land. Whatever good may come in these years of change, the shadow of a deep disappointment rests upon the people. The labor troubadour Joe Hill was executed by the state of Utah on November 19th, 1915, 100 years ago, later this month. From his jail cell in Utah, Hill wrote to Big Bill Haywood in a telegram, don't waste time mourning, organize, a line that became a slogan of the US labor movement. On the eve of his execution, he penned these words. My will is easy to d decide, for there is nothing to divide. My kin don't need to fuss and moan. Moss does not cling to a rolling stone. My body? Oh, if I could choose, I would want to ashes it reduce and let the merry breezes blow my dust to where some flowers grow. Perhaps some fading flower then would come to life and bloom again. This is my last and final will. Good luck to all of you. Joe Hill. In our schools, we're taught about Helen Keller, the deaf and blind girl who became a famous writer. But we rarely learn that she was a socialist and agitator for labor rights. Here is the text of a speech she delivered before the U.S. entry into the First World War in 1917. To begin with, I have a word to say to my good friends, the editors, and others who are moved to pity me. Some people are grieved because they imagine I am in the hands of unscrupulous persons who lead me astray and persuade me to espouse unpopular causes. Now, let it be known once and for all that I do not want their pity. I would not change places with one of them. I know what I am talking about. Let them remember that if I cannot see the fire at the end of their cigarettes, neither can they thread a needle in the dark. <laughs> we are facing a grave crisis in our national life. The few who profit from the labor of the masses want to organize the workers into an army which will protect the interests of the capitalists. You are urged to add to the heavy burdens you already bear, the burden of a larger army and many additional warships. It is in your power to refuse to carry the artillery. You do not need to make a great big noise about it. With the silence and dignity of creators, you can end wars. All you need to do to bring about this stupendous revolution is to straighten up and fold your arms. Congress is not preparing to defend the people of the United States. It is planning to protect the capital of American speculators and investors in Mexico, South America, China, and the Philippines. Incidentally, this preparation will benefit the manufacturers of munitions and war machines. Every modern war has had its root in exploitation. The Civil War? was fought to decide whether the slaveholders of the South or the capitalists of the North should exploit the West. The Spanish-American War decided that the United States should exploit Cuba and the Philippines. The present war is to decide who shall exploit the Balkans, Turkey, Persia, Egypt, India, China, and Africa. We are wetting our sword to scare the victors into sharing the spoils with us. Now, the workers are not interested in the spoils. They will not get any of them anyway. I think the workers are the most unselfish of the children of men. They live and die for other people's country, other people's sentiments, other people's liberties, and other people's happiness. The kind of preparedness the workers want is a reorganization and reconstruction of their whole life, such as never has been attempted by statesmen or governments. It is your duty to insist upon radical measures. It is your business to see that no worker is needlessly exposed to accident or disease. It is your business to make them give you clean cities. It is your business to make them pay you a living wage. 
It is your business to see that the kind of preparedness that is carried into every department in the nation is one in which everyone has a chance to be well-born, well-nourished, and rightly educated. Strike against war, for without you, no battle can be fought. Strike against preparedness that means death and misery to millions of people. Be not dumb, obedient slaves in an army of destruction. Be heroes in an army of construction. One of the most eloquent voices against war was that of Eugene Debs, the railroad union organizer and leader of the Socialist Party from Indiana. On June 18, 1918, he addressed a mass rally of workers in Canton, Ohio, knowing very well that his words could lead as they did to his arrest and imprisonment. After the speech, the Supreme Court upheld unanimously a 10-year prison sentence for the words you hear now that led to his arrest. Sam Johnson declared that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Must have had the Wall Street gentry in mind. Hmm? Or at least their prototypes. For in every age it has been the tyrant, the oppressor, and the exploiter who has wrapped himself in the cloak of patriotism. Or religion. Or both. To deceive and overawe the people. Every solitary one of these aristocratic conspirators and would-be murderers claims to be an arch-patriot. Every one of them insists that the war is being waged to make the world safe for democracy. What humbug. Hmm. What rot. What false premises. Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder. In the Middle Ages, when feudal lords concluded their enlarged domains to increase their power, their prestige, and their wealth, they declared war on one another. But they themselves did not go to war any more than the modern feudal lords, the barons of Wall Street, go to war. The feudal barons of the Middle Ages, the economic predecessors of the capitalists of our day, declared all wars, and their miserable serfs fought all battles. And that is war, in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives. They have always taught and trained you to believe it to be your patriotic duty to go to war and have yourself slaughtered at their command. But in all history of the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. The working class who fight all battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood, furnish their corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It is the ruling class that invariably does both. They alone declare war. They alone make peace. Yours, not reason why. Yours, but to do and die. That is their motto. And we object. On the part of the awakening workers of the nation, if war is right, let it be declared by the people. Yeah. 
One of the best known songs of the Depression era was written in 1932 by E.Y. Yip Harburg, the son of Jewish immigrants from Russia who lived not far from here on the Lower East Side of New York. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a railroad, made it wrong, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare dime? Once I built a tower. in khaki suits gee we look swell full of that yankee doodle dum a half a million boots went slogging through hell and I was a kid with the drum oh say do you remember they call me Al it was you remember I'm your pal brother can you spare a The economic crisis of the 1930s led to a wave of union organizing and strikes throughout the country. Vicki Starr was one of many rank and file activists in the campaign to organize unions in the meatpacking factories of Chicago. I ran away from home at age 17. I had to because there was not enough money to feed the family in 1933 during the Depression. I was doing housework for $4 a week and I hated it. So Herb suggested that I get a job in the stockyards. One of the ways to get a job was to go down to the employment office. Every morning he got there by 6, 6.30. There were just so many benches and they'd all be filled early. They'd only need one, maybe two people this woman, Mrs. McCann, women's hiring director, would look around for the biggest and brawniest person. Have you had experience, she asked. I said, well, not in the stockyards, but we used to butcher our own hogs at home. I carried this big steel, and that impressed Mrs. McCann. She hired me. In 1933-34, we worked six-hour shifts at 37 and a half cents an hour we would have to work at a high rate of speed. It was summer. It'd be so hot that women used to pass out. The ladies' room was on the floor below, and I'd help carry these women down almost vertical stairs into the bathroom. We started talking union. The thing that precipitated it is that on the floor below, they used to make hot dogs, and one of the women, in putting the meat into the chopper, got her fingers caught. There were no safety guards. Her fingers got into the hot dogs and they were chopped off. It was just horrible. Three of us colonizers had a meeting during our break and decided this was the time to have a stoppage. And we did. All six floors went on strike. We just stopped working right inside the building, protesting the speed and the unsafe conditions. We got the company to put in safety devices Soon after the work stoppage, the supervisors were looking for the leaders because people were talking up the action. They found out who was involved, and we were all fired. I was blacklisted. I got a job doing housework again, and it was just horrible. I just couldn't stand it. I'd rather go back and work in a factory any day or night. A friend of mine who had been laid off told me that she got called back to work 
Meanwhile, she had a job in an office and she didn't want to go back to the stockyards, so she asked me if I wanted to go in her place. She had used the name Helen Ellis. I went down to the stockyards and it was the same department, exactly the same job on the floor where I'd been fired, but it was the afternoon and Mrs. McCann wasn't there. Her assistant was. She told me that I would start work the following afternoon. I got my hair cut really short and hennaed. I thinned my eyebrows and penciled them, wore a lot of lipstick and painted my nails. I came in looking sharp and not like a country girl, so I passed right through and I was hired as Helen Ellis on the same job. After several days, the forelady, Mary, who was also Polish, came around and said, okay, Helen, I know you're Stella. I won't say anything, so just keep quiet. She knew I was pro-union, and I guess she was too, so I kept the job as Helen Ellis until I got laid off. Later on, I was blacklisted under the name Ellis. <laughs> if you even talked union, you were fired, so we actually had secret meetings. Everybody had to vouch for anyone that they brought to the meeting. We organized women's groups young women's groups. They liked to dance, and I loved to dance. So we went dancing together, and I talked to them about the union. The women were interested after a while when they saw that the union could actually win things for them, bread and butter things. When I look back now, I really think we had a lot of guts. But I didn't even stop to think about it at the time. It was something that had to be done. We had a goal. That's what we felt had to be done, and we did it. Farmers driven off their lands by the dust bowls of the 1930s traveled throughout the country looking for ways to survive. The songwriter Woody Guthrie described their plight in this song. Lots of folks back east, they say, is leaving almost every day. Beating the hot old dusty way to the California line. Across the desert sands, they're all getting out of that old dust bowl. They think they're going to a sugar bowl, but here is what they find. Now the police at the port of entry say, you're number 14,000 for the take. Got that door in me, boys. If you ain't got that door in me, why you better go back to beautiful Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Georgia, Tennessee, California's a garden of Eden, a paradise to live in, oh, see. But believe it or not. You won't find it so high if you ain't got that door in me. Well, you want to buy a home or a farm that can't deal nobody harm. But take your vacation by the mountains or the sea. Don't swap your old cow for a car. You better stay right where you are. Better take this little tip from me. Because I look through the want ads every day. But the headlines on the papers always say, Oh, if you ain't got that door in me, boys, if you ain't got that door in me, why well, you better go back to beautiful Texas, Oklahoma, Georgia, Kansas, Tennessee, California's a garden of Eden. A paradise to live in, oh, see. But believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got that door in me. Oh, believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got that door in me.
Woody Guthrie's iconic song, This Land is Your Land, was written in response to Irving Berlin's God Bless America. It became a popular anthem, but most versions, whether in school textbooks or performed live, tend to leave out its most radical verses. Here is the complete version of This Land is Your Land. This land is your land, this land is my land From California to New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me As I went walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me an endless high I saw below a golden valley I said this land was made for you and me I roamed and rambled and followed my footsteps To the sparkling sands of the diamond deserts All around me a voice was sounding This land was made for you and me was a high wall there that tried to stop me the sign was painted said private property but on the back side didn't say nothing well that side was made for you and me when the sun came shining and i was strolling the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling the voice was chiming the fog was lifting and say this land was made for you and me one sunny morning in the shadow of the steeple by the relief office i saw my people as they stood hungry i stood there wondering if this land was made for you and me if this land was made for you and me this land was made for you and me. The Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s produced an extraordinary group of black writers and artists. One of the most challenging of these voices was that of the poet Langston Hughes. Here is his prophetic 1938 poem, Kids Who Die. This is for the kids who die in black and white, for kids will die certainly. The old and the rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. Kids will die in the swamps of Mississippi, organizing sharecroppers. Kids will die in the streets of Chicago, organizing workers. Kids will die in the orange groves of California, telling others to get it together. Whites and Filipinos, Negroes and Mexicans. All kinds of kids will die who don't believe in lies and bribes and contentment and a lousy peace. Of course, the wise and the learned who pen editorials in the papers and the gentlemen with doctor in front of their names, black and white, who make surveys and write books and who live on weaving words to smother the kids who die. And the sleazy courts and the bribe-breaching police and the blood-loving generals and the money-loving preachers will all raise their hands against the kids who die. Beating them with laws and clubs and bayonets and bullets to frighten the people, to frighten the people, to frighten the people. For the kids who die are like iron in the blood of the people. And the old and rich don't want the people to taste the iron of the kids who die 
Don't want the people to get wise onto their power, to believe in Angelo Herndon or even get together. Listen, kids who die, maybe now there will be no monument for you. I said, listen, kids who die, maybe now there will be no monument for you except in our hearts. But the day will come, you are sure yourselves that day is coming when the marching feet of the masses will raise for you a living monument of love and joy and laughter. And black hands and white hands clasped as one and a song reaches the sky, the song of the life triumphant through the kids who die. The songs of Minnesota-born singer-songwriter Robert Zimmerman, better known as Bob Dylan, were an unmistakable part of the radicalization of the 1960s in Vietnam era. His 1963 protest song, Masters of War, remains the strongest indictment of war in American popular music. Come, you masters of war. You that build all the guns. You that build the death planes. You that build the big bombs. You that hide behind walls. You that hide behind desks. I just want you to know I can see through your mask. You have never, never done, done nothing, nothing but built to destroy. You play with my world like it's your little toy. You put a gun in my hand and you hide from my eyes. And you turn and run farther when the fast bullets fly. You fasten the triggers before the others to fire. Then you sit back and watch as the death count gets high. You hide in your mansion as young people's blood flows out, flows out of their bodies and is buried. You've thrown the worst fear that could ever be hurled. A fear to bring children into this world. And for threatening my baby, unborn in a name, you ain't worth the blood that runs through your veins. So let me ask you one question. Is your money that good? Will it buy you forgiveness? Or do you think that it could? I think you will find when your death takes its toll, all the money you made will never buy back your soul. I hope that you die and your death will come soon and I follow your casket in the pale afternoon and I watch as your Lord into your deathbed and I stand on your grave till I'm sure that you'll dead.
Civil rights leaders urged the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King not to speak out against the Vietnam War. But in April of 1967, he went to the Riverside Church determined to do precisely that. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. A time has come when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. I deem it of signal importance to try to state clearly and I trust concisely why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war and the Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We have repeatedly faced, been faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village, but we realize they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they asked, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today my own government. Now there is something seductively tempting about stopping there and sending us all off in, for what in some circles has become a popular crusade against the war in Vietnam. I say we must enter that struggle, but I wish to go on now and say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing cler clergy and laymen concerned committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala and Peru. They will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for these and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. So such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam. 
I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. America, the richest and most powerful nation in the world, can well lead the way in this revolution of values. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities so that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. There is nothing to keep us from molding a recalcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. November of 1970, after he was arrested at a protest in Boston at an army base trying to block soldiers from going to Vietnam, Howard Zinn, the inspiration for tonight's program, flew to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore to take part in a debate with a philosopher named Charles Frankel on civil disobedience. Ironically, though, that very night, he was supposed to, that very day, he was supposed to appear in court in Boston in connection with his arrest. So Howard had a choice whether to go to court that day or show up in Baltimore and, and demonstrate his support for civil disobedience. So Howard made the obvious choice in his case and flew to Baltimore to give this speech, which you'll hear tonight. Of course, he was arrested as soon as he got back to his classroom at Boston University. I start from the supposition that the world is topsy-turvy, that things are all wrong, that the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail, that the wrong people are in power and the wrong people are out of power, that the wealth is distributed in this country and the world in such a way as not simply to require small reform, but to require a drastic reallocation of wealth. I start from the supposition that we don't have to say too much about this because we all, all we have to do is think about the state of the world today and realize that things are all upside down. Daniel Berrigan is in jail, a Catholic priest, a poet who opposes the war, and J. Edgar Hoover is free, you see. <laughs> At Kent State University, four students were killed by the National Guard, and students were indicted. So we have to start from that supposition that things are really topsy-turvy. And our topic is topsy-turvy, civil disobedience. As soon as you say the topic is civil disobedience, you are saying, our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. 
Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war. And millions have been killed because of this obedience. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. That's why we're always surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another, no matter what they say. What we are trying to do, I assume, is really to get back to the principles and aims and spirit of the Declaration of Independence. This spirit is resistance to illegitimate authority and to forces that deprive people of their life and liberty and right to pursue happiness. And therefore, under these conditions, it urges the right to alter or abolish their current form of government. And the stress had been on abolish. But to establish the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we are going to need to go outside the law. My hope is that this kind of spirit will take place not just in this country, but in other countries, because they all need it. People in all countries need the spirit of disobedience to the state. And we need a kind of declaration of interdependence among people in all countries in the world of the world who are striving for the same thing. In 2010, Chelsea Manning, formerly known as Private First Class Bradley E. Manning, released hundreds of thousands of classified documents to the transparency organization WikiLeaks. Manning spent nearly a year in solitary confinement before facing court-martial on charges, including aiding the enemy. The following is a transcript of Manning's statement read by her lawyer, David Coombs, after she was sentenced to 35 years in federal prison for her bold and brave act of conscience. The decisions that I made in 2010 were made out of concern for my country, her citizens, and the wider world that we live in. Since the events of September 11, 2001, the U.S. has been involved in a war with an enemy that chose and chooses not to use a traditional battle space. Due to this fact, we altered our methods for combating the risk posed to us in America and our way of life. For a long time, I agreed with these methods. I chose to volunteer and help defend my country. However, it was not until I arrived in Iraq and was finally connecting the dots between the contents of often classified military and diplomatic documents that I worked with on a daily basis and real flesh and blood that I realized in our efforts to meet the risks posed to us by our enemies, we had completely forgotten about our humanity. We consciously and repeatedly elected to devalue human life, both in Iraq and Afghanistan and now elsewhere. When we engaged those we perceived as the enemy, we often killed innocent civilians. And whenever we killed innocent civilians, we chose to not accept responsibilities for these failures and instead hid behind a complex and growing veil of national security and classification in order to avoid public accountability. In our zeal to kill the enemy, we internally debated the definition of torture. We held individuals in Guantanamo Bay for years without due process of law. We inexplicably turned a blind eye to torture and execution by our host nation partners in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we stomached countless other recorded and documented acts in the name of our war on terror. All too often, 
patriotism is the cry extolled when morally and ethically questionable acts are advocated by those in power. When these cries of patriotism drown out any logically based intentions, it is usually the eager and dedicated American soldier on the ground that is given orders to carry out an ill-conceived mission. As the late Howard Zinn once said, there is not a flag large enough to cover the shame of killing innocent people. I understand that my actions violated the law, but I acted only out of a desire to help people. When I chose to disclose classified information to the public, I did so out of a love for my country, her citizens, and a sense of duty to others. I served my time knowing that sometimes you have to pay a heavy price to live in a free society. I will gladly pay that price if it means we could have a country that is truly conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all women and men are created equal. I think we have a, a little bit of a treat for you all. One song that is not in the program. If, uh, if Stu and Hayes and Teddy and Allison would, would rise to the occasion. Stu, no? Yes, maybe, yes. One last number from Robert Zimmerman. <laughs> Bob Dylan. <laughs> They say everything can be replaced Yet every distance is not near So I remember every face Of every man who put me here I see my life I'm shining from the west down to the east. Any day now, any day now, I shall be. They say every man needs protection. They say that every man must fall. Yet I swear I see my reflection in some place so high above it all.
standing next to me in this lonely crowd is a man who swears he's not to blame Shout so loud, crying out, crying out that he was framed. Join me in thanking Susan Porfar, Brian Jones, Allison Moore, Paige Carl, Fatu Chum, Vigo Mortensen, Kathleen Chalfant, Stu, Peter Sarsgaard, and Teddy Thompson. Thank you, Lincoln Center. Thank all of you for coming out. We'll see you on May 19th.